recorded. Are we ready? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ICANN DNS Symposium. Uh, my name is Matt Larson. Uh, I work for ICANN in the office of the CTO, and uh, we helped organize today's event, and I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is not the first uh, technical symposium that ICANN has organized, but this is the first one dedicated to DNS specifically. And we had wanted to do an event like this for some time, and when we sat down and started to figure out, well, what would we have, what kind of content, we realized that there was so much going on just within ICANN alone that we decided to devote the uh, entire day to uh, almost all ICANN uh, subjects today and, and, and ICANN presenters. So I, I, I hope that that, uh, we think it's very interesting content and we hope that, that you agree there was just a lot to talk about and we're very interested to share it with, with the community and, and not only that but also get your feedback. We've left some time at the end of the day to specifically get everyone's uh, comments because you know, it's very important to us to, to get the community's reaction and get the community's feedback to, uh, to what we're working on. So uh, with that being said, just a few uh, logistics. Uh, today's session is being recorded and there is remote participation. So we will have, um, thanks to Steve Conti for managing the remote participation queue. Um, please, when you uh, want to make a comment, we've got, got mics, so uh, just out of courtesy to those who are participating remotely, uh, please do come to a mic to make a comment. Uh, please state your name and, and affiliation. Uh, we will be serving lunch, uh, more on that when we get closer, closer to the time. But uh, with, with that, with all the logistics out of the way, uh, we're, we're very pleased and honored to have uh, two speakers this morning to, to kick things off. So I'd like to start off by uh, introducing ICANN's CEO, Euron Marby. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? I still think it's sort of a personal revenge from Mrs. Wait a minute. Is that better? You can hear me now. Unfortunately for you. I still think it's sort of a personal revenge for Mr. David Conrad to set me up to speak at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Yeah. So, because of that, I'm going to be fairly short. And anyone who meets Mr. Conrad today can just have a look at him. <laughs> um, yesterday I was reminded about something. Uh, about a year ago, um, I was actually appointed as the President and CEO of ICANN. And if anyone has any problems with that, you can look at Steve. And during my first uh, interview I ever did in my new position, the um, journalist afterwards said that I was by far the nerdiest and techiest uh, CEO of ICANN so far. I also realized that was maybe not a big, you know, there was no challenge in that competition. Uh, but he based that on, on two things. First of them was actually I spoke about technology, which is something that we often forgot, forget about how the importance of it. And, and, and I happen to think that there's a lot of people out there who says sort of that internet is done. You know, we, we see now the internet that's going to exist for the next thousand years. There is nothing else to do without it. Um, and I think we have to challenge that. And the only way we can do that is to bring smart people into a room and actually ask the questions that we need to ask. And I think we have too little of that kind of discussions within ICANN. And I try to promote that as much as I can. There is another thing with that as well, which I also noted, that surprised uh, the journalist. And that is that I spoke about, we have to do that with equal partners. For instance, I know that we have, there's a lot of ICF people here, isn't it? And I already in that interview, I said that I think that ICF as an equal partner, we need to find ways of discussing with them. And that's why I'm so happy to see so many of you. I was also happy to see that we also, from ICANN's side, support ITF financially and, and with people and other stuff. Um, and I think that is something that we have to continue to do on an equal footing. Because the matter is that internet has never been done before. No one has done it. A lot of the questions that we are facing, no one has seen before. 
And the only way to answer those questions is to put smart people in a room and discuss them. And we will do mistakes. We will do the wrong things. We have to try. We have to do errors. And we have to continue. I challenge the fact that people said there is a rule book how to do this going forward, um, because the questions has never been asked before, and especially when it comes to technology. I didn't take this job a year ago because I'm gifted to a technology. I took this job because I happen to think when you bring people together on an electronic network, magic happens. It's not about you know, the existing technology or preserving it. It's actually by challenging it. Many of you who are in this room, one point in time, have stood up and challenged the way we do things. We challenged it and we tried to change it. And I hope that conversation can continue. But I can't go on without also mentioning the fact that things have changed. Maybe you are aware of that last year we did what is now called the famous transition, where now um, you actually took control of what we call the IANA functions by building new checks and balances to it. And again, some people seem to think that that was the end of the discussion. Now we're done. We don't have to do anything more. I actually think it's a very good way of actually starting a basis for a new discussion. How are we going to evolve? How are we going to change? How are we going to continue doing what we're doing, but even in a new format? So from me side and my team from ICANN, we will continue to support the discussion. And please let me know if there's anything else we can do to support. Because at the end, we're all in this together. And there's today, and I still don't know how to calculate it, but it seems to be about 4 billion people connected to one major network. But one of the things we need to be better of going forward is that I, internet is two things. It's a global interconnected network, but it's also very local. The next billion users, one and a half billion users, will come from very different places than we have today. They will be primarily mobile, and they will come out of Asia and Africa. They will not have the ordinary English language skills. They will be very local in their information consumption, where they go on the net, but also how they use it. And that's just one of the things I think that we need to solve going forward. Finally, it was an interesting day to be in this space yesterday, wasn't it, with this new attack? It's sort of interesting when you realize that the thing that you've been talking about is going to happen for a very long time finally happens. And people are surprised that it's actually happened. That is kind of a probability that we all, we said this for a long time, this is going to happen. And now it happens, they ask me, why didn't you say anything? I hope that this, whatever happened, um, I also understand that there were some very smart people who actually challenged it by using the DNS. Um, I think this could be a new way of discussing this, both locally and globally going forward. I don't know enough about the attack, uh, but I know that for right now, we have an opportunity to talk about things that is actually fairly important. And maybe a lot of more people will actually listen to you going forward. I hope they will not forget it for something else happening tomorrow or today. There is a much more important event happening in Europe this week, and that is the Eurovision Song Contest. Has anyone thought that was a joke? <laughs> Europe is very inclusive. This year we included Australia. Anyway, my friends, I will keep it short um, because it's very early in the morning. Thank you very much for having me here. And thank you very much for showing up so early in the morning on a Saturday in Madrid. Thank you. Thank you, Joran, very much, especially for uh, the Saturday morning part. Um, our next speaker, uh, I'm uh, excited and happy to introduce um, Dr. Steve Crocker, ICANN's Chairman of the Board. Thank you, Matt. It's good to be here. And there's a debate between standing or sitting, and um, I think we've chosen to sit, but that makes it hard to see the numerous people all the way back there. This is very well attended. This is this is super. Um, so I appreciate the uh, invitation to say a few words. Um, uh, Matt introduced the, the, this meeting as part of a sequence of meetings. Uh, I think this is pretty important, and uh, uh, I think we're all going to learn quite a bit. I expect to learn quite a bit today. I'm going to talk mainly about the technical aspects of DNS 
but I chose the title uh, ICANN and Technical Work, really? Yes. Uh, with, uh, to highlight what I think is an important uh, development within ICANN. So I've been watching ICANN for quite a few years now and have always felt that it was uh, a little underpowered technically, although we've done some great technical work over the years. Uh, but it has come along quite a, quite a lot over these uh, past few, over the recent few years. Um, political and uh, contractual issues dominated a lot of our attention, a lot of our resources, uh, and particularly with the transition. And those forces are not going to go away, but the technical issues are going to uh, have been getting and will continue to get more attention. And I think that that's just excellent. Uh, there's also an organizational component to it. Uh, David Conrad, our chief technical officer, is part of the senior management team and works alongside um, uh, Ashwin, our uh, chief information officer. And so we've got uh, core strength right at the top level. And um, even better, th this guy actually knows something about the technology or did once upon a time and um, like that. Um, a little more subtle, but from my point of view, quite noteworthy. Uh, the team that uh, reports to David, Matt, Roy, um, Paul, um, uh, uh, Elaine, uh, several people, I'm going to miss a few here, uh, are outstanding in their own right. They're people whose reputations and accomplishments preceded their uh, time at ICANN. So we have, a, we have a team of stars. We have, a, we have enormous strength. Um, and I hope the trend continues and that uh, ICANN becomes known as a place for the best and the brightest in the field to consider joining uh, so that we're not just viewed as uh, poor cousins of the people who really know what's going on. That's the end of the uh, hype and the pitch about, the, uh, about ICANN and technical strength. I'll, I'll try to stay focused on the uh, core subject here. So the DNS layer is peculiar within the internet ecosystem. It's a vibrant business in selling of names. And almost no market at all for the operation of the lookup of the queries. Um, it's a very odd layer in the structure. Uh, we don't have uh, analysts on Wall Street following the businesses that are in the DNS uh, lookup and response uh, business uh, as, a, as a general rule. And a, a few businesses, but not much. Yet a huge amount rests on this on this layer, um, essentially the entire internet. Um, so we've got a very peculiar upside down economy. One consequence is that the development and the research is done mostly by academic and the nonprofit community. Uh, I worry a bit about this uh, sort of economic imbalance and uh, what consequences it might have, has had, and might have in the future. And I'll mention a little bit of it uh, at the tail end, but uh, it's a topic that I think will have to come up um, for some attention over time uh, over the next few years. But meanwhile, on the technical level, there's a lot of activity, a lot of activity, which brings us here today. So DNS is, by internet standards, a really old system. Um, and yet, um, along the lines that Joran mentioned, it's continuing to expand and to evolve. You have the Internet of Things, the connection to Dane, and other forces like to, to expand the number of DNS records in the entire system by an order of magnitude or perhaps more than that. The core design, I think, remains strong and can handle the load, but there will be pressure on various aspects. You don't scale something up and put the kind of loads on it without there being some stresses around the edges. Much of what you're going to hear about today is about measurement. Measurement is essential. And the increase in measurement activity and the development of better measurement and reporting tools also essential. Measurements tell us how well the system's working and often bring to light aspects we had not really expected. Measurements are just one part of a classic trio of modeling, metrics, and measurement. And one of my messages this morning is that in addition to measurements, we need more extensive models and we need to work with models to find and predict how systems will work, uh, how, how they'll behave. Um, under stress uh, as we uh, scale up the system. And I want to focus on three aspects in particular, DNSSEC, performance, and software reliability. 
DNSSEC, uh, I'm sure all of you know, has been a long-standing effort, um, and, uh, but it's progressing. Um, a significant event, the key rollover uh, for the uh, key signing key uh, of the route is taking place in stages with the big event scheduled for October 11 this year. Your t-shirts have the public part of the new key. So I hope all of your systems are able to receive and install the new key without you having to copy it from the t-shirt. With respect to deployment, the progress is mixed, though compared to the deployment of IPv6, the progress is lightning quick. Um, let me have the slide. Here's the status of DNSSEC deployment in the CCTLDs. Uh, the dark green is uh, full-scale deployment. That means that there's a DS record in the route for the TLD, and the TLD is accepting uh, signed uh, records from uh, DS records from uh, its registrants. The light green is one stage before that where the DS record is in the route for the TLD, but it's not yet accepting uh, registrations. That's typically a transitional um, state, and so with the notable exception of Africa, it looks pretty dense. Uh, and there's an awful lot of things that don't show up very well on a map like this, very small countries, islands, and so forth. But the numbers are pretty good. And the, uh, the GTLD numbers are uh, equally good. Could be in part because we insisted as, a, uh, as one of the rules for the new GTLDs that they had to implement uh, DNSSEC. That's the good news. The signing of enterprises and uh, second, third levels below the TLDs, and the actual checking of signatures, not as far along as we'd like and need some help. Um, but it's, it's moving, and I don't want to go too far down that path. I've spent about a decade intensively working in this area, and uh, it's dangerous if I, if I keep cranking up. But we'll mention that we're also seeing some issues that have to be addressed that are uh, uh, getting more attention. We're not part of our mindset at the beginning, but our um, uh, now taking up some time. One, of course, I mentioned Dane. The integration is important. It opens up a lot of uh, uses for DNSSEC. And indeed, we always understood that in addition to protecting the DNS layer itself, uh, that it provided a platform on which you could build other uh, uh, trust uh, uh, capabilities. And, uh, and that's working out. Um, uh, size of responses due to IPv6, key rollover, and long RSA keys is uh, uh, an issue that may or may not bite us uh, a bit. We'll have to work through that. Um, that will provide some pressure to move to uh, elliptic curve uh, keys. Uh, we'll see how all of that goes. It's um, uh, a little uncertain whether everybody gets comfortable with that. All I think that's pretty, um, by now, should be pretty straightforward. Um, I'm also hearing pressure about the speed of validation, that browser vendors uh, care a lot about this and uh, provide some pushback, so we're going to have to uh, probably see some engineering to, uh, to cache um, prior uh, validations, etc. cetera. Uh, another one that just recently came to my attention is local trust anchors. Um, the home networking group in the IETF uh, has wrestled with how to get their uh, protocol, which is focused on um, uh, how to configure things in a, in a home or some s similar small environment, and how that fits into DNSSEC. Uh, I've looked at it a little bit, and I'm, I can't say that I have uh, the final word on it, but it seems to me that the, the essence of the issue is that in addition to a signed key for the root, there have to be signed keys for all the local anchors, and that is uh, an area that I have not seen explored very much, and it's going to take some work. Um, doable. I think it's eminently doable. Um, so I'd rather see it attacked rather than avoided. Um, performance issues. So DNS, like every other layer of the Internet, is full of very complex interactions. One of the key elements in the DNS architecture is the caching resolver, and we all know that without uh, caching resolvers, the system would fall over uh, quickly. They wouldn't scale properly. Uh, the rule for caching resolvers is quite simple. The TTL says how long to keep the prior uh, response, and if necessary, it's okay to discard it sooner if you don't have space to keep it. Keep it. What actually happens 
despite the rule, is considerably more varied. Some, uh, some resolvers have minimum times and effectively raise the TTL. Some extend the TTL as long as lookups for that name uh, continue to come in. Some generate ghost queries to the authoritative servers for negative queries they've seen recently. Um, uh, I have to credit uh, Jeff Houston for this little tidbit, and I hope I've conveyed it accurately, and if not, uh, the blame is mine. Um, but the point of all of this is that these and other variations are motivated by the individual developers or the local operator's ideas of what the best policy is. What's hard to tell, however, is what the overall impact of these separate decisions turns out to be and how they interact with each other. So the kind of measurement activity that is being reported today and being carried out across the world and that many of you are involved in will shed some light. But let me suggest that in addition to the measurements, it would be helpful to look at the various policies in the abstract to see what behavior is predictable and where the stress points are likely to be. I'll give a small anecdote uh, from the earliest days of the ARPANET, uh, which doesn't have anything to do with DNS because we didn't have it at that time, but uh, for, uh, you know, uh, with apologies for doing a little bit of arithmetic at this early hour. So the routers on the ARPANET were called IMPs, uh, and they accepted uh, a unit of information from the host that was called at the time a message, and it could be up to 8,000 bits. And then inside the IMP, it was broken up into 1,000-bit packets, and from one to eight of these packets were then transmitted to the, uh, through the subnet to the other side, and the receiving IMP would reassemble these 1,000-bit uh, packets into a full message before transmitting it into the receiving host. Um, Buffer allocation inside of these imps was a uh, very, very uh, sensitive matter because there wasn't very much memory. Um, there were uh, buffers for the packets, and then there turned out to be a, a requirement for an additional small uh, piece of storage which kept track of the eight packets as they're arriving. So at the receiving imp, you had the, you know, the packets arrived, maybe they'd arrived in order, maybe they wouldn't, but in any case, you needed all eight of them in the extreme before you could begin transmitting that assemblage uh, into the host. And so there had to be a little bit of uh, uh, storage, a little buffer that had pointers to the, uh, to the eight packets to hold that uh, uh, with some irony, it's called a handle. Uh, there was a small pool for these handles, and um, uh, one of the things, these guys who wrote the IMP code were very clever. Uh, they said, well, you know, if it's just a one-packet message, we don't have to bother with all of that. So one-packet messages weren't subjected to this and didn't require uh, a handle. And the, the traffic in the ARPANET uh, in the early days was very bimodal. There was interactive traffic, which had very short messages. And then there were effectively file transfers in which you'd send as much as you could. So the messages were eight packets. So you had typically uh, under 1,000 bit, you had one packet messages, and you had eight packet messages, and you had very, very few instances of packets of uh, intermediate size. But there was another form of traffic that was generated. How many of you are doing the arithmetic as we do this? And we'll, we'll see where this goes. Another form of traffic that was generated internally by the IMPs, which was measurements. And those measurements were uh, uh, each IMPs view of its interactions with all of the other IMPs in the network. And so it had a little table of statistics. And every so often, it would gather those statistics and put it into an internally generated messages, uh, message and slip it into the stream. And it would wind up at the uh, network monitoring center. Well, the length of that message that it sent started out to be pretty small when the network was small. And as the network grew and grew, these messages got to be a bit longer. There came a day when those messages broke the limit of fitting into one packet. And it just software had actually generated two packet messages. Not quite foreseen was the fact that um, if you have two packet messages, you're using up one handle for every two packets, as opposed to long messages were used up one handle for every eight messages. So that's a factor of four uh, increase in the rate at which you're using these handles. And the number of handles that were allocated, the number of handle buffers that were allocated, turned out to be not quite big enough. And there was uh, a, a freeze that happened as these uh, messages would arrive and not have a handle that they could allocate. And uh, in those days when something broke in one imp, it backed up everything. And so the network crashed completely across the entire system. Um, easily understood after the fact, fixed fairly quickly, uh, could have been caught 
if somebody had thought about doing it at the arithmetic, at the symbolic level, and said, oh, uh, are we staying within these limits? So that's a small example of the kind of thing that I'm talking about where you can reason about these things if you have a, a picture of how things, without necessarily having to wait for it to happen or having to measure. The measurements are enormously helpful to find things that you can't reason about. They're enormously helpful in validating your models, uh, but I would argue that it's good to have models. Um, so um, uh, it, it's, it's a rant that I'm probably going to continue. Um, but I'd like to see a strategic, uh, let's see, I'm a little ahead of myself. One second. All right, so a little analysis. So it'd be good to bring these models, to develop models, to talk about them, to share them, and have that be part of uh, what the discussions are as we design systems, and particularly as we analyze them. The last thing I want to talk about is software reliability. Um, I've already stressed how vital this whole layer of software is. Uh, if it breaks, the results are bad. And one of my strongest fears is a latent bug might be discovered in widely deployed DNS software and the threat that it might be exploited in a way that causes widespread outage or some other forms of disruption uh, is particularly troublesome. So how many of you actually write DNS software here? Some of you, I know. Yeah. And I'll bet that every one of you takes the job quite seriously and uh, um, reasons about your code, debugs your code, documents your code. And uh, the only uh, real problem is that uh, as good as, as you all are, uh, we're all quite human and make various kinds of mistakes. And uh, some of these live to bite us. Um, worse yet, we're living in an environment, I remember I, I mentioned funding at the outset. We live in, a, in a, an environment where the main pressure is on new features, on higher performance, and, uh, and, and that's where the pressure comes from. So things are not lined up in a positive way, and it's only by um, diligence and uh, extraordinary efforts that things work as well as they do today. But it bothers me a lot. So I'd like to see a strategic effort uh, to transform the development process to provide much higher assurance, including better tools for analyzing the attack surface of software. Not an easy subject, uh, one that is uh, technically extremely challenging. But I think it's important. And the good news is that I think it is indeed possible to make significant progress. There's been big advances in the tools to analyze software, provide assurance that software does what it's supposed to do and uh, doesn't do what it's not supposed to do. So that's the, uh, the main set of things that I want to say. I'll just sum up by saying this. ICANN is growing stronger technically. We'll make, an increasing, uh, we'll make increasing contributions to the community. This is a good thing. Security is vital and will be ever more so. DNSX is one of the main forms of protections. It's only partially deployed and used. More is needed, and there are some emerging challenges. Performance issues are important to require a lot of attention. Use modeling as well as measurement to find the bottlenecks and other issues. And the reliability of DNS software is vital. We cannot, cannot afford a large-scale disruption. We need to improve our analysis techniques. We need to insist on the highest quality standards. Thank you for listening. We have a fully packed program and a fully packed room. This is great. This will be a very substantive day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you again, Euron. Thank you to both of you for coming here on a Saturday morning.